His karate lessons might not turn him into a black belt. Hi-ya! And even after band camp, he might not be the greatest musician. But with the 3% annual percentage yield you can earn on a PenFed premium online savings account, your goal of supporting his dreams... Thanks for everything, Mom and Dad. ...will always be worth it. Apply today at PenFed.org slash savings. Federally insured by NCUA. $5 minimum to open account. To receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed. PenFed's got great rates for everyone. Well, I got my heart up in a beautiful home. Hey friends, today's guest is Chuck Regan, vocalist and guitarist for the Gainesville, Florida punk rock band, Hot Water Music. Together we break down the writing, recording, and inspiration behind the fan favorite single, Drag My Body, taken from their 2012 album, Exister. The band chose to work and record with producer Bill Stevenson at the Blasting Room in Fort Collins, Colorado. Chuck mentioned that the vibe in the studio mixed with the vibe of everyone participating was electric and super conducive to productivity. He went on to say that he finds he's at his sharpest and most mentally present first thing in the morning, preferring not to stare at anything resembling a screen, be it a phone, television, or otherwise, for the first 30 minutes of his day upon waking. This simple practice sets the tone for Chuck's day and also serves as a time where lyrics just seem to flow out of him. I'm just another opinion here, but personally, I think this song is one of Hot Water Music's finest hours. Stand to hold steady now. Take a breath and somehow. Take a step to begin again. After all, we can only do our best. Indeed. So for all this and a whole lot more, don't touch that dial. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Chuck, my friend, you're a repeat offender here on the show. Repeat offender. That's me. Yes. <laughs> I don't know where the time has went. It's been three years. When it seems like I just talked to you about Remedy, it was January 11th, 2021. <laughs> wow. Man, really? Yeah, wow. it, was, it was right after those crazy wildfires you guys had out there. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure enough. Well, always good to see you, my friend. Always good to see you. I, I got to tell you, I had a chance, and my listeners know this, to and the the rare opportunity to to join a band for one show. And I went down, and I know I talked about this, uh, you know, uh, on the last episode to play with you guys. And one of the songs that uh, I was lucky enough to play uh, is the song we're we're going to talk about today, "Drag My Body." Yeah, I'm I'm careful when I say this. You'll get it because I feel like, and I've had people say this to me before. It all it's almost like you're uh, you're not giving a nod to their new stuff and you're you're still making new material. Hey, I'm still a valid songwriter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, I think that Drag My Body might be one of your finest works as as a song, uh individual song that you wrote and as a band. Oh, wow. Well, thank you, man. Yeah, I mean, I love that song. It's a heavy heavy tune in terms of the content and and um and it it's something that i feel or that i've noticed really kind of people get it people gravitate to it it's it's a simple song about just keeping our chin up man i mean mm-hmm. it's, it's as as simple as that in tough times and and uh and i've noticed that you know we've played that song just full on throttle down loud and electric and and then i've played that song quite a bit acoustic uh just stripped down by myself and uh it still works it still translates and it gets the point across and and you know that's something that as you know as a songwriter like that doesn't always work with all 
all of our songs, you know? Yeah. Especially a big, a big live electric hard rock band. Uh, and, and a lot of times I'll write these rock songs as you will on acoustic and they don't translate back. <laughs> you know, they translate as you're writing them, but they don't translate back, but drag my body does. And, and I have to say, I want to ref- refresh your memory. I don't know if you recall, it was kind of on the spot when we were down there. I begged you guys for one rehearsal. You gave me one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I said, please, I'm freaking out here. You guys are like, yeah, you got oh, it. Man. I'm like, I got what you haven't even heard me play note one. So <laughs> I, I, I appreciate uh, that trust. I still think about that a lot, but if you recall, call we kind of morphed it you did the intro by yourself and then the whole band came in now i saw you play the next night in sao paulo a solo show before i took the red eye flight out that night yeah i got yeah. to catch you am i making this up i don't think so i believe i saw you play drag my body acoustic that that night i'm pretty sure i did yeah yeah, yeah. And and uh, the place going as nuts as it had the night before. And talk to me about writing the song. Do you recall uh, the moment you wrote it? That whole session, Exister, uh, we recorded at the uh, Blasting Room. And we were living there. You know, Livermore and Bill were... Uh, there was a whole crew. There was an amazing crew there. Uh, but Bill and, and Jason were the ones that uh, we were spending the most time with. And uh, the live-in studio situation, to me, there's nothing better, you know, when it comes to making a record. There's pros and cons to it, I guess. Uh, but to me, the pros far outweigh the cons. The pros being when you go into a studio you can and a lit in a live-in situation and for folks that don't know what i'm talking about this is a recording studio where you have beds and bathrooms and you have a kind of a separate kitchen kitchen where you're just there you're living throughout the entire session or you know whatever project you're doing And the pros to doing it that way to me is you completely submerge and saturate yourself with the material that you're working on in the moment. And there's so much to be said for that. And getting away from just day-to-day distractions and time, you know, the time that it takes, those are the pros. The cons are... There are possibilities that that you can overthink stuff, spend too much time on stuff, and go down rabbit holes because it's all you're looking at. It's all you're dealing <laughs> yeah. with. And every once in a while, yeah, you can go out to dinner, go out to lunch, you know, get out of the out of the box, so, as we say. Opposed to doing a session where you're living elsewhere and you're you're trapped going to the studio. You wake up in the morning and you go through your morning routine and then maybe you stop and get coffee on the way or maybe some breakfast and this and that. And by the time you get down there, you know, you've already been up for six hours, you know, <laughs> yeah. and then you're walking in and then you're trying to kind of switch your brain and like, okay, here's, here's what we're doing. Well, I don't know if you know, I, I was just there a couple months ago. We finally recorded with, with Bill and Jason. And I, I gotta, I gotta tell you everything that, that you're saying is spot on. And for the listeners, yeah. you know, they have a compound out there. The best way I could describe it. It's like a, uh, you know, mm-hmm. an, a, a building you'd see in an industrial park that when you right. walk in, uh, as, as Chuck explained, there's, you know, yeah. the different, different recording rooms, the kitchen, the living facilities, et cetera. Yeah. And it's just really conducive to immersing yourself in a project as you said especially if you're living there that that's all you got you can look over hey jason what about that bridge part you know (laughs) right yeah a hundred percent you know a lot of those existor songs that session as i recall we weren't fully prepared when we went into that studio we had a bunch of material but there was only man i mean (sighs) I would have to ask the guys, but I feel like my memory serves like we maybe only had half of the songs finished, finished. Was Drag My Body one of them, do you remember? And and were you playing Drag My Body acoustic as, as Chuck Reagan prior? 
No, there was a part that was there, as I remember. I feel like we had kind of a different chorus in the very, very beginning. Uh, I do remember finishing the lyrics there at the studio. And as far as uh, tracking it, I don't know what it was. I'm an early riser, as it is. And for me, the couple hours in the morning when I get up is is about the clearest <laughs> I'll be all day, you know, and even more so the first 30 minutes, right, of being awake. And this is even kind of before coffee, you know, before, you know, the first few sips, like that, there's a little window uh, where I can see clearly what I need to do in my life or that day or in the next five hours, right? And, uh, you know, at home, you know, my daily routine is when I get up and this is whether I'm guiding, you know, uh, have trips or whether I'm on dad duty or whatnot, but I get up, let the dog up, feed the dog, get a big jar of lemon water, like squeeze a lemon in a big jar of water, slam that, put the coffee on. And then I sit down with, I have a a little notebook and I sit down just with a pen and a paper. And, and it's, it's crucial to me. And I mean, I would suggest this to anyone. Don't look at a screen right when you get up. Don't even give yourself an as long as you can without looking at your phone, even if you're looking at what time it is. Okay. I feel like my my mind as soon as as soon as that light, I see that artificial light on a screen and I see the time and I see the date and I see an app or or i see something i lose it i lose it that's interesting and uh to me like there's there's a a a little window where i've had my water and coffee's going sometimes i already have the coffee ready and uh, i sit down with that pad of paper and it just comes to me right away you know of exactly what needs to happen. Oh, I need to service the generator today. Um, I need to finish the lyrics of that second verse and blah, blah, blah. We have that clarity in the morning. Yeah, it sounds like it's that. that's your time. It's your solace. As long as you don't let uh, other things interrupt that, that you're, you're going to be able to somehow have a stream of consciousness and, and you see your day uh, laid out in front of you. I, 100%. I, yeah. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try that one day. That's a really interesting way to approach the day. A couple things uh, about Exister real quick, Chuck, before we get into the song. Uh, Exister was your seventh full-length album. Uh, released May 15th, 2012 on Rise Records. Exister was Hot Water Music's first full length uh, of original material since 2004, the new What's Next. A lot happened in those eight years, okay? It's well documented. Yeah. Uh, the, the band and yourself had, had many different projects. You really got going with your solo career during mm-hmm. that time. Brian McTurnan was the producer on that record, uh, and the album before it, 2002's Caution, featured Remedy, which we talked to you about last time. Uh, Exister, as you said, produced by Bill Stevenson at the Blasting Room, Drag My Body is track number five out of 13. And in this song, uh, if I were the guitar player, I'd be on the left-hand side. That's where Chris Wallard's parts are that I play down in Sao Paulo. <laughs> so when I, I kind of had uh, some deja vu here when I put the headphones on for this one and, and started analyzing it. I absolutely, our friendship aside, I told you at the top, absolutely love every note and nuance of this song i think bill pushed you as a vocalist i know he kicked my butt a couple months ago oh yeah i haven't been i haven't been pushed like that yeah as a vocalist in a long time and mm-hmm. it was refreshing and i and it reminded me that i'm not as good as i sometimes think i am and i need that as a musician uh the song's three minutes and 21 seconds the intro's just you my friend well i got my heart up in a beautiful mess. 
Well, I got my heart up in a beautiful mess. <laughs> and I want to talk about, yeah. real quick, with that opening line, which really struck me after working with Bill. You know, Bill was saying things to me like, you sound closed off. I need you rounder. I need you. He was, he was talking in shape and things and I you know at some point I sang this one line I'm not kidding probably 50 times and I just stopped I said Bill I'm not trying to take my ball and bat and go home here partner but I, I don't know what you're looking for he goes yeah well whatever you whatever you did last isn't it <laughs> <laughs> So this See? first line, this first line, okay, and you're you're already, and I remember you back in the day when you were smoking a carton of cigarettes and drinking a bottle of whiskey yeah. a night. But it sounds like you sang this first line after an all nighter. I mean, it's just it's grovelly. There's like a crack in your vocal, and I'm wondering how that got past Bill, or he did he just love the authenticity of it? That's what you sound like. I think he loved that. Um, I what I do remember the most about tracking these vocals is i think i want to say we started we tracked those vocals between 9 30 a.m and like 11 <laughs> because like i said I, I was i'm an early riser and um uh, i was getting up pretty early working on lyrics in that clarity window that i was talking about um, I write a lot of lyrics in the morning when I'm clear. And uh, I find that it's it's either one extreme or the other. Either I write lyrics or, or actually more so, I probably start it late at night, very not clear. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I edit and finish in the morning with clarity. Who was, uh, oh man, it's on the tip of my tongue. The writer that used to say, write drunk, edit sober. Um, <laughs> I love that. That's, that, that's, uh, that's sage advice. Oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. But what I do remember is we were, I was recording a lot of my vocals. And for some reason, Bill loved it because he would come in and I would already be jacked up ready to go i'd already been drinking coffee for two hours you already got a whole boat full of fish like you're ready to go your day is almost <laughs> over let's sing let's sing and i would go into the vocal booth and he would think i would i was crazy but i would get a big jar of water i would grab a couple cans of guinness and a big pint glass of absurdly strong coffee <laughs> just <laughs> <laughs> uppers and downers right just going in and bill was just like this <laughs> let's go sometimes <laughs> sometimes a, a a big shot of whiskey you know kind of right before we would get going and it, and more so that was just to get my head out of the editing process get my head out of the like i'm working on this and yeah and transition to the, I am this, where I'm being this. Now it's time to tell the story. It's not time to write the story. It's time to tell it. And Bill, he was so fantastic, man. I mean, like he would just kind of turn me loose and let me go. And he's really awesome at like reining you in when you need or pushing you just a little bit farther, you know, when you think you can't go any further. Well, hey, let me tell you something. He told me straight up, mm -hmm. I'm going to toot your horn here, but he told me you and Matt Skiba are the best, easiest vocalists he ever recorded. Oh, that's... And, and, he, and he told me out of all the guitar players he's tracked in his life, that Chris Waller was the easiest guitar player to ever track. Yeah. He said, the guy comes in and just plays it once and it's perfect. Well, what are you going to change? I'm like, wow. So, hey, you got two out of four guys he, he couldn't stop raving about. And how how can you talk smack about Black and, and Rebello? You can't, which yeah. we're going to get to in a second. Yeah. But real quick, Chris is here to, to provide us with an answer. I never butt in on an episode, but I'm going to do it today. That quote, you're probably thinking it's Hemingway, right? Hemingway. God, I don't know. But I don't know how <laughs> I didn't. I don't think it's Hemingway, though, Chris. What do you? What do you? It was on the tip of my tongue. I was like, "Has, has, has." 
New, yeah. <laughs> Don't feel bad though, Chuck. Hemingway. Don't feel bad that you didn't remember it because it's falsely attributed to Hemingway. Uh, Everyone thinks Hemingway said it. He actually didn't. It was just made up. So there you go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to give the quote to Chuck Reagan. Then that, that that's your quote. It's not Hemingway's quote. I'm giving it to you. Yeah. Couple things here. Verse one. Okay. Uh, the drums, bass, and stereo guitars left and right are riffing off of each other with these kind of high arpeggiated parts. They don't truly become what I call stereo guitars until the chorus, when they both go to a strumming pattern. The bass and drums, man, they just sound amazing. The bass tone is just ripping in the song. To me, probably some of Jason's best work that I've ever heard him do i mean his in his entire career i mean he plays magic stuff over everything i know every, i know but for some reason this popped out and man I, I mean all of us just we wanted that spotlighted everybody could hear it mm, you know no this was this was knocked out of the park Ooh. i mean it's just it, it, it sounds so good. Well, I got my heart up in a beautiful man. I should have known better when I took the rest. I had a wreck myself and a gamble I broke. Yeah, shaking sentimental. I lost for the right time. Well, I got my heart up in a beautiful mess. I should have known better when I took the risk. You had to wreck myself and gamble while broke. Yeah, shaking something mental at a loss for the words I'd once known. I traded two steps forward for three steps back to get to know the meaning of showing respect. I found the pedestals and burned them down to kill my idols and to bury the thoughts underground. I'm no longer deaf to the sounds. Yeah, man. I haven't thought about it in a long time. It's, you know, it's a song that touches a lot on probably one of the main topics that hot water has always shared in music and um i mean not to sound cliche because i feel like the term is used so often nowadays but mental health this song talks a lot about uh insecurities and uh just being completely broken down, feeling that there is very few options or ways out. Well, I got to tell you, I really didn't know where you were going with this. Yes, that's a big theme w within Hot Water. Uh, but just looking at these lyrics, you could have told me they were about anything and I I'd probably love them the same. There's something about, you know, these... These speak to me differently, and that's the beauty of songwriting, as we know, than, than they do to you and they do to the next person listening. You, you take, take something away. I get, I get lifted up by this song. Uh, halfway through verse one, on two steps, the lyric, uh, two steps forward to three steps back, the guitar panned off left. I'm calling the Chris Waller guitar. It starts playing this palm beauty part, uh, kind of with this delay on it. It's very suspenseful and insanely catchy. It's like the James Bond part. Uh, I I love this part um and yeah. i guess you could make a case here for a pre-chorus chuck when it gets to underground i'm no longer deaf to the sounds that little part there is kind of yeah. a setup for the chorus i'm considering it part of the verse here but both the guitars there go back to playing off one another as that palm mute guitar part cuts out and i feel there that uh that palm uh, muting part cutting out there chuck before the chorus there uh it lets the verse breathe a bit before it goes to the chorus how did these parts get get uh, put together in the studio because i've i've always admired and loved what you and chris do uh you know counter melodies off one another with the guitars i didn't realize how special it was and 
until I was afforded the opportunity to, to play with you guys. And now looking back on it here going, hmm, did Chris think of that? Did Chuck think of that? You know, how'd the verse uh, overdubs come together? Sure. Waller, you know, I mean, I'm a very, I would say pretty mediocre guitar player, you know, um, I never was extremely talented at the guitar as it was. And then, you know, back in the day, you know, severed my tendons in my hand where, where, you know, half of my hand is still numb and, uh, I don't have the dexterity in both of these hands, you know, that's as far as I can open up that one. I find that like uh, uh, so many parts like that, like uh, usually it starts with Chris. I mean, I'm kind of hanging back, letting stuff ring, doing little notey stuff here and there. But all of that came from, you know, a Wallard brain. He's so difficult to emulate because he rarely plays the same thing twice in a song. You know, when I was studying it, parts of him go, what, what is this guy doing here? It's almost right. like a jazz, it's like a jazz player. Right. Where it's kind yeah. of free, free form through the song. And I'd never played guitar like that. The parts, there's some of them that are, that are really tricky, but most of them aren't that hard. But my brain never looked down and saw my fingers in the position they were. Some stuff he was playing is just sure. really, really yeah. interesting. Love what's going on here. Um, do you recall getting in there? Uh, with this song and 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 things changing in the verse, did Bill like everything up to the chorus? Oh man, that's a little blurry. Um, I mean, I like I said, I I somehow remember a, a, a completely different chorus. Yeah, and I remember like simplifying it. Uh, you know, when we rolled into Blasting Room, the first thing Bill had us do which was awesome, is we set up in Studio B, I think it was. That's the smaller one, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and we just set up where they rehearse, where, you know, all Bill's bands rehearse. And um, we just set up in a live style. And the whole plan was just to start ripping through songs and grind it out, work out the kinks, you know, and man, it was fun. It was so fun. And we had, we had three or four days of that. And I feel like that's where we just kind of like simplified that whole thing and, you know, brought it, brought it to the home, you know, that it, well then man, you, then you guys were smoking then by three or four days, you must've had that vibe because like, Oh, because then I'm talking about the vibe of that studio. It's such a creative space. A hundred percent. I was going to say, like, how could you not, you know, just walking into the place, you know? Yeah. We were so juiced and jacked up to know that we, we were going to be there, live there, you know, like we were, I, I can't remember exactly how long we were there. You'd have to ask Bill, but I feel like it was at least a month. Yeah. You know, that's a solid and, time. Yeah. And just knowing, just knowing like what we had ahead of us was just exciting, man. And, uh, yeah, it was so cool too, because the whole time we were tracking or or the whole time we were doing that pre-pro, uh, you know, right when we got there, Bill was, Bill would pop in and out of the control room. Right. And he'd be listening. He would, we were recording, we were listening to parts, look, looking for kinks, looking for tempos. We were looking for anything that did not belong, right? And listening for anything that may belong, right? And it was just a super creative, healthy process. Hey, everybody, we got to take a quick break for a word from our sponsors, but we'll be right back with part two of this conversation with Chuck Reagan. With Lucky Land slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Lucky. 
Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. One Hit Thunder is a podcast where we both celebrate and have a good laugh about bands and artists that had just one hit that we all know. Each week, we're joined by a guest from the world of music or comedy to learn more than you ever thought you would about some songs that you can't forget. And we decide if they brought the one-hit thunder or were nothing more than a one-hit blunder. Look, if you listen to the show, you're probably going to laugh, and I guarantee you're going to crush next time the bar has music trivia. Tag Team, Jane Child, Meredith Brooks, Looking Glass, Sean Mullins, Eiffel 65, EMF, Crash Test Dummies, Crazy Town, Chumbawamba. We have hundreds of episodes in our back catalog and a new episode each week. So pass the duchy, make sure you're connected, and subscribe to One Hit Thunder wherever you get your pods. Battle, know your Prove your and, walk the and now, back to the show. Chorus one is right off the heels of verse one and the lyric. And and you kind of said it a minute ago, Chuck. I kind of felt like for a chorus for Hot Water Music, this was kind of like a little bit of a simplified idea. You know, it seems like some of your choruses get a little wordier. And uh, do you think maybe you don't remember the first chorus? I know maybe Bill had something to do with that. Like, hey, let's rein this back a little bit. I love this chorus. I think it's perfect. I'm glad there's not a bunch of information. I feel like as a listener, you can you can grasp onto it. Mm-hmm. Do you recall that being part of the conversation? Let, let's let's make this a little more chorusy. I remember whatever we had was was a lot more complicated, a lot more wordy, you know. And um, those lyrics were there. I remember those lyrics kind of being in there early on uh, in the process of this song, as in uh, I'm hardly feeling human anymore. A lot of this song came from coming to waking up on, on a floor with that clarity that we were talking about earlier. And uh, it did come from a rather dark place, like a lot of, a lot of hot water songs do. Mm-hmm. You know, the one thing that is just always crucial to me with uh, hot water songs or my songs, anything I write, you know, especially with how I treat music and how I treat writing as, as more so a form of, of therapy or journaling, you know, kind of figuring myself out, figuring (laughs) out my shoes, my problems, how I'm going to fix whatever is happening. Right. And, uh, you know, what's crucial is that there's always at least a vision of a path to a light at the end of the tunnel or, you know, a, a vehicle or s- some way out. Yeah. I'm hardly feeling human anymore enough to drag my body from the floor. And I can hear very clearly that we get another vocal here. The vocals definitely doubled, but I'm hearing a harmony, not a full harmony the whole time. It's like there's some unison and some harmonies going on there. Was that Chris singing with you? Is that you doubled? I think we did a little of both. Okay. I think we did a little of both. Because it does sound like a doubled lead vocal and another vocal, like I said, that's kind of unison, but there's some harmonies going too, and it's very subtle and pushed back. I like where the harmony sits. Yeah. Very cool. The drums go to double time on the kick and snare on the one and three of the choruses. On the second and fourth times, the drums go not like a swing band from the 40s, but they go to this kind of swing feel that George just has that. He's... Got yeah. that fluidity uh, as a drummer. Uh, and the stereo guitars are driving and strumming together in the chorus. It's the one time in the song where the guitars are just kind of, you know, in, in unison, which that doesn't happen a lot of times with Hot Water. You guys are uh, playing different stuff. That's a very rare thing uh, that I remember that came up in a conversation a long time ago somewhere right around that uh, before that session about how a lot of our choruses and uh you know parts were just so jumbled 
No, and that's when it got to this chorus part. I'm like, oh, I can play C sharp minor A E to B. Yeah, yeah this this is this is right up my alley. Uh, uh, I, I can play oh, this yeah. this all day long, but the the rest of it I'm going to need to work on. Coming out of chorus one, we got a four bar turnaround with the bass and drums. The stereo guitars are hanging over, ringing out, and it really yeah. gives Jason a chance to shine. That bass run. It's so absurd. I remember when we when we shot the video for this song in LA and uh I was I was a team player. I was like, you guys tell me what you want to do. Like I I'll, I'll do whatever you need me to do. I love know? the video by the way. I think the video is a different look for you guys. It's pretty cool. It's way cool, yeah. But I had one thing that I talked to the the director and I was like <laughs> the only thing is when Jason Black does that bass fill, put the damn camera on him when he does that bass fill. That's my only, that's my two cents. After that, I'm shutting up. <laughs> and like that, that was the only thing I told him. I'm like, that is my favorite part of the song. Like, you got to do it. <laughs> no, and I'll tell you, I, I get asked a lot who some of my favorite musicians are, and if they, they ask who's your favorite bassist, I you know I, I put Jason in there now. You know he doesn't get talked enough in in punk rock cir circles, in my opinion. He doesn't get talked to, about enough of of what he brings to the yeah. table. Verse two is right off this four bar turnaround. <laughs> I got my head up in a critical mess, fighting like a demon in a shell I possess, gnashing my teeth and speaking in tongues, still shaking something mental at a loss for the words I'd once known. Something's rattling my bones. Couple things in here. Uh, mm -hmm. Gnashing, I guess, is like grinding your teeth. What an interesting word, gnashing. I mean, did Bill ever say, that's kind of a weird word. Like, that's, did he ever talk about your lyrics? And by the way, verse two here is my favorite lyrics in the song. There's something captivating about these. He loved the lyrics. And um, he actually, he wrote one, uh, I wrote all these lyrics. Bill wrote one word that I remember very clearly because I got stumped when we started singing that second verse and I can't even remember which word it was, but I had another word in place of critical, right? Ah. Got my head up in a, and I can't even remember what I had, but I sang it and I just stopped and I'm like, it, it just didn't flow. It didn't feel right. And I just sat there and he was like, what's wrong? And I'm like, there's something there's got to be a better way to say this, you know, and we both sat in silence. I remember staring at our lyric sheets for what felt like an hour, but it in reality <laughs> is probably minutes, you know, and, uh, and it was just deadpan silent and we we're just looking and he just went to the talk back mic and he said, critical and i was like just put my hand up <laughs> and he started the verse back over and i sang it that way and uh so that was that, that was bill's lyrical contribution in uh drag my body interesting okay well you know verse two is half the length of verse one this verse picks up 
where the back half of verse one uh, happens instrument wise, meaning that at the start of verse two, we get that yeah. Wallard run off to the left, that little suspenseful part I'm talking about that comes right in uh, on verse two. It's not halfway through here on the last line uh, words. I'd once known something's rattling my bones uh, on the line. Uh, something's rattling my bones there before we get into chorus two, there's a different snare fill here than verse one. It really lifts into chorus two. I went and a would those. A lot of times, as you know, you're working in Pro Tools, things get flown, copy and pasted. Yeah. A different snare here, and, and I love uh, how that uh, lifts verse two into chorus two. Chorus two is a double chorus. Same lyrics and basic instrumentation. However, on the second time through, I'm hardly feeling human anymore. The melody changes here on the lead vocal. It's killer. Was that the way you were feeling it? Or do you remember Bill saying, hey, let's push for something here? I'm a believer. I know Bill is like change is always good in a song. Progression is always good. When you get to a point where you're singing the same thing or even playing the same part, and it happens a second or a third time or a fourth time, you know, having little nuances or, or little lifts, little uh, rises that just elevate it to a different plane, even though it's the same part, to me is always healthy. Well, I love it here because, as I said, the lyric doesn't change. So if you're going to keep the same lyric, at least go somewhere else as you did melody wise. Right. I think it's killer, man. Coming yeah. right off of chorus two. We get an eight bar instrumental bridge before the actual mm. vocal bridge. Okay, talk about the bass again. I mean, Mm. The tone, mm -hmm. the tone and placement. And I know how meticulous Bill is. Yeah. I saw what he did with Roger. And and Roger's quick in the studio, proficient bass player. But the stuff he was saying to him was just like, I'm going, oh my gosh, he's got him under a, the, the tightest microscope he's ever been put under. I can hear that here. I know he pushed Jason. I can hear it in the performance. It's just, yeah. it's so good. The drums, bass, and stereo guitars, uh, they all hit here on ding, ding, ding. And, and it's uh, yeah. on bars one, three, four five and seven here fairly straightforward rock part but it's so good do you remember writing that in the studio or do you remember having that because that doesn't seem like a typical if there is a typical hot water part you know anytime george and jason get on their wavelengths they've known each other for so long and these guys they're both magical and absolutely ridiculous at the same time <laughs> in, in the sense that you can if you're sitting there it, riding with them or whatnot in the time frame of you know an hour whatever you will hear them fight you will hear, hear them laugh you will hear them make fun of each other you will hear them you know, where you think like, oh man, you know, like he's not going to talk to him for another week after that. <laughs> Yet uh, they have this, they have, they speak their own language, you yeah. know? And uh, what's cool about it to me to witness all of this is more often than not, they already know what Phil to do while they're playing they <laughs> it's that they quick know what what some type of fill and usually the way it happens is it's just a look from one of one or the other right and then they'll hit it and then the other one will acknowledge what just happened and then will then on the next pass it'll 
it'll be on. And just what you said speaks about the human connection in bands. You know, you could get yeah. someone maybe who's considered a better technical bass player than Jason and bring him into your band. There's never going to be that connection. That guy didn't grow up with George eating popsicles when they were 10 years old. You know, there's something there's something to be said about that. Yeah, they're they're truly a unit. Uh, yeah, that's you can't deny that. And you can hear it. Well, the lyrics to the bridge come in after eight bars. We get eight more bars here uh, of the band. Uh, the drums get tighter, especially the hi-hat going closed. Bass is driving this part. The drums uh, are, are in as well, uh, kind of like with uh, with that closed hi-hat, just uh, accenting with yeah. the bass. The guitar panned off left is playing uh, some ring-out chords, and the guitar right is playing a broken-up palm mute part. That would be you. And I wrote in my notes... <laughs> I can hear I can hear the Florida in this palm mute. I hear 38 special. I hear that that like, you know, co- you know, uh, hold on loosely. You know, I'm like you could take the kid out of Bradenton, but uh you can't right. you can't fool me, man. I I can hear the right. I, I can hear that influence. I love this part. Stand to hold steady now. Take a breath and somehow take a step to begin again. After all, we can only do our best. That's the light at the end of the tunnel there. That's it, right? What we were talking about earlier. And man, look, we all go through difficult times. And I'll never say, you know, my times are any more difficult than anybody else's, you know, for the most part, we're talking about first world problems, right? There's a lot of people on this planet that have it. They're not sitting around doing a podcast right now no. with a jar. Of coffee and They're trying to figure out where the, where the water for the village is going to come. No, I know. That's right. And, uh, you know, but in, in, in telling our stories, like, um, growing up feeling so lucky that somehow I le- I was dropped into a field of a music community that looked at songwriting and touring and playing as as a way to bond with one another and looking at at songs and these lyrics as a way to better ourselves better our community better our relationships and have more understanding of ourself, our own insecurities. That moment in the song is all always important to me because, you know, we're, we're all going to end up on the ground at one point or, or another, right? And we have a choice, you know, we have a choice to make a decision to pick ourselves up or just lay down, you know, good buddy of mine used to say when it, when we'd get frustrated, he, he would say, we either swing for the punches or lay down, lay down and do nothing. And for some of us, only one of those is an option, Mm. you know, and, and in other words, like we're not going to quit, you know, we got to realize our faults. We got to realize you know, recognize where we go wrong, you know, where we failed. But more importantly, we have to realize uh, that we do have the power to to pick ourselves up. As you said it here, to, to take a step and to begin again. Yeah, and make it to the next day, you know. I dig it. Well, right out of the bridge, chorus three, it's another double chorus. Same lyrics and basic instrumentation. That third line, you go up on that melody again, it it changes again. And then we get into the last part of the song. Uh, I I call it a four-bar coda. I'm calling this a coda. It's Mm. basically the bridge. It's on the one and three, that bum, 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 uh, that that, uh, part from the bridge comes back.
begins with a super hopeful vocal, uh, which is that first line from the bridge. And you say, stand and hold steady now. And man, I know you'll be, you're going to be able to relate to this. Sometimes a lyric will evoke a mental image for a number of reasons. I'll hear a song from my childhood and I can smell my dad's cigar going to the, to the baseball game or, you know, I, it just conjures up those images. Uh, I've heard this song. I don't know how many times uh, the very last time I listened to this while I was taking notes, Chuck, honest to uh, on my life, the stand and hold steady. Now I wrote in my notes, I wrote the first thing I wrote was whoa, Nelly. Then I wrote settle down. And then the third image was a boat and you're coming out of just a horrific storm. Okay. The, yeah. It's still choppy. Okay. The rain slowed down and you can see the sun just barely cresting up that I got all those images. When I read that line, stand and hold steady, you know, it's going to get bumpy again, probably, but hold steady. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I love that lyric. Um, uh, such an awesome song. I think that what it doesn't surprise me, that's the wrong word, but well, I'm, I'm proud of you guys. This is a later career song to have this big of an impact on your fan base. Uh, I talk about it all the time on this show. Uh, and I just spoke about it a minute ago. You know, music will bring back memories. And the longer the time goes by and you have those memories, the longer you have a chance of having something that was meaningful song wise. And this song's only, you know, just over 10 years old. One of your biggest songs, one of my favorite hot water songs. And speaking of hot water songs, got a new record coming out May 10th on Equal Vision. Yeah. You guys are uh, going old school here. You're back with Brian McTurnan. Yeah. 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 We, you know, after, uh, Feel the Void. It was such, Feel the Void was tough. More so just kind of the process of it because we were coming out of the pandemic and everybody was so spread out and there was so much going on in everybody's lives, just trying to make ends meet and everything. And, but we got through it. There was a ton of angst and a lot of junk in that record. And I feel, but, but what we realized and recognized was what a team that was, you know, Ryan Williams, engineering, uh, McTurnan and the process that we kind of tapped into where we were more or less working in two different studios, kind of in tandem, you know, where drums were going down in one studio with uh you know ghost tracks scratch tracks or whatever it was getting flown over and we're singing we're singing you know that day it was just a, a good formula you know and uh jason and i realized that 2024 was going to be our 30 year anniversary in the middle of a conversation that we were having <laughs> back, in, back in like i i mean i don't even think feel the void was out yet yeah um but, you know, we were kind of talking about what we were doing. And, you know, nowadays you open your phone and a couple swipes and you're you're three years <laughs> ahead. Yeah. Right. We're just kind of looking. And then it occurred to us like, oh, wow, this is our 30 year anniversary year. And from that point, it's like, OK, well, we need to work backwards now. You know, I mean, that's how we do a lot of our scheduling. It's like if we want to do this on this date, that means we need to have this ready by here. That means we need to have this all the way back to like, oh man, we need to start writing now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're trying to connect and the dots before you have the dots. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but this, uh, this new record vows, I would say is without a doubt, the most prepared that we'd ever been going into a studio. And the energy was just incredible. Uh, everybody, you know, and I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that it's been 30 years. There were old stories, conversation, you know, a lot of nostalgia, you know, um, it was just, a, it was a wonderful experience, you know, and being more prepared than we'd ever been, you know, there was not a whole lot of, 
you know, pushback or waiting. It's like, we just went in, we knew what we were doing. We knew what we needed to do and we just got to work and, um, you know, everybody just did a heck of a job. Well, I love that. You know, you, you guys don't have any, anything to prove to anybody. You've been around for 30 years. You got, you don't, I've said this before <laughs> about bands. I consider legacy bands. If you never recorded another note, you got so many great songs. People are going to come see you play. It's like, the only person I have to impress now is me. You know, I got I want to try to better myself in the studio and that seems like uh like what you guys did. But Chuck, thank you so much for uh, carving out some more time for me. I uh Oh, I, it's we'll, my pleasure. We'll probably do it again. I love talking to you and uh I I, lo- I love your songs. I've I've loved your band for a long time. Uh, and when I got a chance to play with you guys, it just it, it took it even a step further if if that's even even well, possible. Huge buddy. All right, well, until next time. The song you're hearing is called Menace, and it's from Hot Water Music's new album called Vows that comes out on May 10th, 2024, so make sure you check that out. And I hope you all enjoyed this conversation with Chuck Reagan, but don't go anywhere. We got lots more Chris to Make's a podcast coming right up after a few words from our sponsors. Hey, this is Dewey Halpas, host of Peer Pleasure on the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. Join me each week as I explore another long-form conversation with one of your favorite musicians, actors, comedians, or creatives. From Chino Moreno of the Deftones, John Gorley of Portugal, the man, to Fat Mike from No Effects, and Ian Mackay from Fugazi and Minor Threat, we go all over the map. From Fall Out Boy to Slayer, Peer Pleasure has it all. Check us out now on Sound Talent Media. As we near the end of the show, here's a band you might not know. Welcome to this week's Band You Might Not Know. If you'd like your band to be considered for Chris to Makes a Podcast, email your best song and a short bio to band you might not know at gmail.com. This week's featured artist is Sharp Eyes, a five piece pop punk rock band from Essex, United Kingdom. You can find their music on all the streaming services. Here's a snippet of their song, Past Your Best. Well, I know what you like, better off, better right. Wanna see what you say about this? The Rap with Chris and Chris. So Chris, Chuck said something that I don't think I've heard any guests say before. He gave the advice of not looking at a screen right when you get up. I haven't heard anyone say that. Chuck said he feels like his mind has a little window where he can sit down with a pad and paper and things come to him right away before he looks at a screen. I want to do this now. Have you done that? No, not the screen part, but I... I was kind of tripping out when he was talking about this. I felt like my brain wasn't here because so many, I started thinking about so many things. And one of them was my father always used to say very young, you know, don't talk business or something important with somebody at the end of the day, no matter what. Okay. That person you've, you've had the whole day you've had, you've been stuck in traffic. You were, you had the fight with your boss earlier. You had grocery shopping, all these things. You're tired. You know, do the meeting first thing in the morning when you're fresh, you know, before the day's stresses have got, have gotten onto you. Makes a lot of sense. It's kind of like a clean slate. Yeah. You wake up, you got a clean slate, how you want to set your day. Uh, I don't know. It, it's, it's almost like a, a his meditation. It's interesting because I totally understand why that would be. You look at your phone, you have 10 emails you feel like you have to get back to, you have things that start stressing you out, maybe you read the news and something stresses you out, all of a sudden you're distracted and being creative is that much harder. So it completely makes sense. I would like it if I could do this one day a week even. I feel like I would get a lot done. <laughs> yeah. And I just love, uh, you know, Chuck talking about being in there. I could see him 930 in the morning with a Guinness, a whiskey and a coffee 
So yeah, he's in there. And, you know, I mentioned to Chuck, I, I had Bill just put me through the ringer this last time and it was welcomed. I wanted to be pushed, but you know, it's almost like Bill just accepted that this is what his voice sounds like. And it's almost like, yeah, go ahead and, 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 and have some whiskey and, and sing at 930 in the morning. That's what you're supposed to sound like. I wish I had gotten that lucky, but it's great. Like I said, that opening line, his voice kind of cracks on like he's been up for three nights, but that's what hot water's about. Yeah, it's part of their sound. It's and awesome. you can't you can't fake that. And uh, through the sound of his voice, it conveys a lot of emotion. You know, there's people... The best singers in the world couldn't do what Chuck does. No. You know, Chuck does his own thing, and you can't even put a price tag on something like that, you know? Yeah, it's a completely genuine... Uh, it, it comes from a place, again, you, you could be the most technically proficient singer in the world, but this this comes from a di- from a different place. It's guttural. Uh, I've, I've, I've always loved that about Hot Water Music. You know, the records they've done since, they did a record called Light It Up, then Feel the Void, and now Vows. I haven't heard, I heard the uh, single off of Vows, but I gotta tell you, I really believe that this session with Bill elevated them as musicians. I think that they learned a lot. You know, the record after this, they recorded in Gainesville on their own budget they self-produced and it sounds great but uh uh i just can't rave enough about the production on this jason black has never sounded better yeah it sounds great and like chuck brought up the live-in studio situation that just breeds creativity i know you've experienced it a lot of times now right chris or so let me ask you when you've recorded now i've been in a lot of situations where we're away recording and we're staying somewhere close but i maybe once but have you stayed like in the studio like on the grounds of the studio oh yeah well when we made uh the anthem record we stayed at morning view studios uh out out in malibu so we 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 were in house for that um we didn't stay roger stayed at the blasting room this time he stayed there but the uh, four of us we got an airbnb which was conveniently one mile it was 1.1 mile away from the studio so if the weather was a little bit warmer uh not as much ice on the ground we were there i pro- probably would have walked it back and forth a couple it was a, a nice walk but you know chuck had touched on just uh how awesome the blasting room uh, you know how conducive it is to to writing they got in there and they did pre-production for a couple days and that's why i said man by the third day you just had to be like on autopilot because we didn't have that luxury we went in we had i think we were there for nine days of recording total i think we were there for like 11 days we had like two days off and it was just go from the time we got there and it it took a second to to get in but uh it sounds like from the moment they were there they were inspired doesn't sound like they were very prepared with the songs from exister sounds like they went in and kind of kind of wrote things but sometimes uh, magic can happen that way too yeah studio magic Sometimes, you know, not overthinking things. Now, I wouldn't recommend (laughs) to bands to go into the studio without most of it prepared. But unless you're hot water music, (laughs) maybe, or or some, you know, if you're very seasoned or lucky, maybe, if you're lucky and write something (laughs) good in the studio, uh, that could end up being a real uh, waste of money (laughs) if if you do that sometimes. But that's not the way it worked out for hot water music. Uh, I also, Chris, I got to say, that when he got into, especially when you were talking about the bridge, how just the subject matter of this song, how we're all going to end up on the ground at one point or another, and we all have a choice to either pick ourselves up or just lay down. You know, when he was saying that, it really made me think, it brought it around full circle. It made me think, for me, it's music that has always picked me back up. Music has always, both listening to it And playing it has done that for me. I'm sure it's done it for Chuck. I'm sure it's done it for you. And uh, I feel real fortunate that music's in my life that way. You know, I was thinking about that when he was saying that. Absolutely. And if you have a chance, go check out, look for uh, Chuck doing an acoustic version of this. It's just, uh, it's it's as powerful uh, as the recording and it's it's its own animal. It's very cool. And if you're not already a member of our supporting cast, head over to chrisdemakes.com where you can sign up uh, for our VIP program. It's called Supporting Cast. We'll give you extra bonus episodes each week. Check it out, chrisdemakes.com. And give us a follow on Instagram, at chrisdemakesapodcast, as well as my friend, at Chris Fafalius. And give me a follow, too, at Less Than Christy. Want to thank this week's guest, Chuck Reagan, for sitting in the hot seat. And we'll see you next time. Hey. 
Hey everybody, Satan here. I know what you're thinking. Jesus Christ, Satan has a podcast now too? No, no, that's not it. But I am here to tell you about a podcast, and it's one that's all about my favorite band, Punchline. Not the band you expected me to say, right? You probably figured I'd like Slayer, or maybe some backwards Beatles records or something. Those are okay. But you usually find me rocking out to fan-favorite punchline albums like Action or Lion while I'm torturing dead people for all of eternity. (laughs) Punchline's podcast is called A Band Called Punchline, and it's super entertaining to listen to this documentary-style look back at the 25 years of my favorite band. Honestly, I'm really feeling like I'm getting to know these guys, and their story is amazing! I'm so ready for them to get down here. I have so many questions. I gotta give them credit for catching on to my whole 37 thing, too. There's a reason why they're my favorite band, and if you listen to their podcast, they might become yours, too. A band called Punchline is available wherever you listen to podcasts. Check it out, and I'll see you all in hell. Hey, this is Chris Swinney, formerly of the Ataris and currently host of That One Time on Tour, part of the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. Have you ever wondered what it's really like on the road? The highs can be euphoric, but the lows can be crushing. Join me every week as I chat with industry pros about what it's like living out their wildest dream and in some cases, their worst nightmare. Past guests of the show include members of NoFX, Pennywise, Bad Religion, and more. Listen and subscribe at SoundTalentMedia.com. Hey you, do you have any plans this year? Ha! How's that going? Did you get 2020? Well, welcome to a brand new podcast called 2020, where myself, Benny Goodman, and my good friends, Corey Pazin and Siobhan Cronin from the band Lost Symphony, also got 2020. And since the world ended this year, we decided why not just check in with some of our friends in the music industry and see how everyone's doing. We're going to get a candid look at life on and off the stage, as well as the mindset of some of the most successful people in the entertainment industry. New episodes drop every Sunday and Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern. And you can listen at 20. 020-D.com, soundtalentmedia.com, or on your favorite podcast app.